You know, so one of the uh, most common things that I hear people tell me when I tell, uh, when I introduce myself to people that I majored both in philosophy and math is that, oh, wow, those are two very different subjects. It's interesting how you major in those two at the same time. Or just, they just straight up say that I'm a maniac, that I study both at the same time. You might have a point there, or they might have a point there that I'm a maniac. But um, I don't necessarily agree that philosophy and uh, math are different, very different. They are actually very similar in nature. And I just wanted to make a brief video explaining why that is the case. And perhaps why they are the best, best major combinations, actually, or the perfect major combinations. They have the synergy effect going on uh, that co complement each other very well, basically. So I just wanted to make a short video on that. Uh, number one is going to be that they both follow a very similar logical structure. So math is all about justification. So if you have a theorem that you want to prove, if you have a conjecture that you're thinking about, if you have an equation you want to solve, every single thing you do in math, you have to justify each step. For instance, if you want to solve an equation, 2x plus 1 is equal to 3, how would you solve that equation? Well, first you have to make sure you um, subtract 1 from both sides so that you isolate that variable by itself, uh, 2x. So 2x is equal to 2. And now what? Since you want to isolate that variable by itself, you have to divide both sides by 2, which means you have x is equal to 1. So you see there's there are two steps. First is to subtract uh, 1 from both sides. The next step is to divide 2 by both from both sides. So those are the two steps you need to justify. Sufficient justification is the only way you can go from one step to another. If you somehow BS your way through justifications, then that's not going to work. So for instance, if you say 2x plus 1 is equal to 3, and you're like, oh, let's just subtract 1 from left side. So 2x is equal to 3. Um, oh, and um, now let's just say x is equal to 3, because let's just get rid of that too, you know. You can't do that. That's illegal. Um, so you have to have this uh, justification that is grounded on foundational mathematics, uh, or the principles of math. That actually works very similarly in philosophy too. If you if you have studied philosophy before, you will know. There are premises and conclusion that you want to have in your argument. So um, I can't think of a specific example on top of my head right now. Uh, but for instance, if you if you study Aquinas's um, five ways and think about his uh, argument for existence of God, there are certain premises that he lays out, and he will have to justify from one premise to the next one to the next one to the next one. And finally reach the conclusion that God exists because God has to have moved the first stone or whatnot. So in that case, you see that there is a very logically similar structure. So in math, you have to go from the first step to x plus 1 is equal to 3, which is given to you, to the conclusion. You have two steps in that specific example. In that other case that I'm talking about, there's probably like five or six steps. So you have to take these each steps to get to the conclusion. And you'll be able to find that actually there is a lot of different subjects that kind of implement the similar structure. But what I mean by having a very similar logical structure is that they are grounded in logic. And um, because philosophy, actually, the foundations of philosophy all come from logic as well. I talked about this in my other video, but um, the reason why you can go from one step to another in philosophy, too, is grounded in logic, just like how math is. So they are very similar in na nature. It's a bit hard to explain um, how they are very similarly logically similar. <laughs> that was a brain fire. How they are logically very similar um, without implementing like super specific examples. But that would be really hard for me to do because then you would have to have background in both math and philosophy. So I'm, I'm not entirely sure how I would do that. Maybe I'll think of a way to do it, but um, they are very different. I mean, they, sorry, they are, they are very similar in logical structures because of the fact that they are both based and grounded in foundational logic. And number two is that they're, they're both very abstract. So you are studying abstract uh, things by nature. So like like in math, do you ever go around and talk to mathematicians and they say like, oh, you know, I excavated this number two the other day and like it's going to be revolutionary. Or you, you go to the mathematician's lab, lab and say, oh, like how did the mass experiment go the other day? Oh, like it went well, like I, I had the conjectures set up and like I set up a few variables and then 
I did the experiment and it turns out that I have, you know, no one, no one talks like this. No mathematicians are ever going to be like this. Like, I mean, maybe if you're a statistician, your, your conversations might look different, but what I'm talking about here is pure math. So you never have those conversations because of the fact that numbers are abstract. You can't touch numbers. You can't, you can't really like see physical numbers. Like, yes, you can write down a number two, for instance, on a paper, and that counts as a physical, that might count as a physical manifestation, but it doesn't mean that that two is, by essence, the number two that we are talking about all the time. It's not the case that the number two that I write here is the most special number two that we talk about all the time, so that everyone in the world is talking about this specific number two that I wrote on the paper. That is not the case. So, I mean, I can go on, actually. There's like a specific a branch of philosophy that talk about the existence of numbers or the nature of numbers. So this is a very deep conversation we can have. But anyway, so that's not the point of the video though. So the point is it is, it is abstract, abstract. So you think about these things that you can't see with your senses or, or you can't really feel with your senses. And it's, that, that is very different from science or engineering, for instance. So you can, uh, I don't know, like a example, for example, astronomy, you can at least see the moon and you know that exists like right there. Even though I guess you can't like necessarily touch it, but you theoretically could if you have the necessary spaceships or whatnot. You, like there are people who went to moon and actually like touched the ground, but that's not the case for mass. And in philosophy, it happens to be very similar. So philosophers have no labs, just like mathematicians. And um, all they need is basically some books and their brain. So they read a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of articles and books and think about uh, very interesting questions such as, uh, does God exist? Um, what is a moral thing to do? Like, what is the morality in general? Like, how do we know something is moral? Those kinds of stuff, very interesting questions. They, talk, they think about that all the time. And yeah, all they need is chalkboard or, or paper, some books and brain, and that's basically it, you know? So you don't have to carry your own entire lab. Your brain is basically your lab, much like math, you know? So you see mathematicians writing a lot of stuff on the board. Uh, philosophers don't write that much on the board, but they do have a lot of notes, uh, I've observed. So they do think about very, they both think about abstract things. And the reason why the house complement each other is that if you think about abstract things a lot, then you develop this sense for abstract things in general. So like, um, just like how you, I don't, uh, if you keep on riding the bicycle a lot, then you get better at riding the bicycle. Or if you keep practicing, uh, I don't know, skiing or playing tennis or any kind of sport, like you, if you practice more, then you get better. Just like that. You have the sense or the muscle, brain muscles for thinking about abstract things. And that abstract brain muscle only develops if you think more about abstract things. And by studying math, you develop that. By studying philosophy, you also develop that. So if you are spending a lot of time doing that, then that definitely helps in terms of studying both math and philosophy. So it kind of complements very well. And uh, number three, they are both for, uh, foundational for any subject out there today that exists. So I talked a little bit about this uh, before in this video, but um, basically math stems from philosophy because the foundations of philosophy uh, is logic. So you might have heard of the, the three sets of sentences. Um, Socrates is a man, all, every man is mortal, so Socrates is mortal. Th that kind of syllogism is the, the rock solid bottom of foundation of philosophy and logic. And from those, all those interesting mathematical logic and all those beautiful propositional logics and all those systems of logic spanned and uh, was created. And that, those, all those uh, systems of logic are the foundations of mathematics. And all those mathematics that are being done are based off of those systems of logic. So you might very well say that prerequisite for mathematics is philosophy in some sense, but it just happens so that not many people appreciate that, that that's the case. Um, and actually in math, we don't really like, they don't really talk about the philosophical nature that much, at least uh, from what I've observed in my 12 plus years of schooling, like 16, I don't know. But anyway, so um, that's the case. But what about philosophy? Um, philosophy itself is, all, yeah, is well, no, sorry, I meant mathematics. Mathematics itself is also very foundational in nature because all the modern science and engineering and statistics and all, they all stem from math. Because if you 
you, you can't you can't do um, any kind of science or engineering without any mass. That is impossible. So mass is always at the center of those things. So like I, I remember distinctly thinking about this question in uh, in my, one of my physics course. This is actually uh, one of the re big reasons why I converted to mass major. Maybe I'll make another video about this later. But yeah, in, in classical mechanics course, the professor was lecturing about um, the gravitational force equation, I think. And um, and I asked him, why do we use this equation in a certain way? Like, well, how does that work? Like, why do we, you know, uh, arrive at this kind of equation this way? And I remember distinctly saying, um, my physics professor saying, you know, we don't do that in physics departments. You should go ask your math friends in the math department. And I distinctly remember, yeah, physics don't really think about the foundations of mathematics. They just use it. They just use math. But at the same time, it is at the center of physics because I could, there were more mass equations on the board than words. And there were some diagrams too, but more, like 75% or 80% were all mass. And even when I'm doing problem sets, I and I ended up using so much mass. Like there are there is an initial setup you need to have for physics uh, class. Like for instance, oh, let's say that the Earth is this um, much, it weighs this much, Moon weighs this much, there's distance between those two is this, and then according to Newton's gravitational blah blah blah, you set this up and then rest is just mass. Setting up is like one quarter maybe, or even less than that. Then the rest is basically just mass. So that's how usually it works for all sciences. Like there are some, there are some branches that use less of mass, but I don't think there's any that literally uses no mass at all, which means, yeah, mass is very foundational in nature too. And in philosophy too, it is very foundational by nature because basically every discipline in modern society all stemmed from philosophy. I can I also talked about this briefly previously, but um, you know, like mathematics, for instance, uh, stem from philosophy, and which can by by saying that I also mean that science also stemmed by philosophy. But uh, not even if you don't want to be concerned with math. Um, Aristotle did a lot of physics, actually. I know a lot of well, a lot of things that he said is wrong, but still, he laid out the foundations of what kinds of questions that phys physicists should look for in his book called Physics, aptly named Physics. And yeah, and um, there were some biology going on in one of his books too. I forget exactly what book it was, but you know, um, philosophers were all thinking about scientific questions too, actually, in the in the ancient Greek era. And um, sociology, psychology, they all like stem from philosophy too. For instance, Sigmund Freud's uh, theory of psychology, of course, a lot of them are wrong too, but um, they all stem from philosophy as well. Um, he was very inspired by philosophers. Um, and, you know, if you go into the history of any discipline, the start is usually most likely going to be inspired by some kind of philosophy or philosopher's text. So that is how they both are foundational. And that's the reason why they both act well as um, a, very, yeah, a very foundational system. Because like, if you study philosophy, you will be very well prepared to jump into any kind of discipline. Like for instance, I remember uh, I, I took a course in political theory uh, on Arendt and Foucault. And I had no background in political science whatsoever, except like U.S. government, basic high school level. And I was just interested in learning more about Arendt and Foucault's political theory. And although it is more philosophical in nature, it was still a very much a political theory uh, and political science course. And I was a little nervous about the prospect of being in that class as a non-political science major. But it turns out that I actually was very well equipped with the skills that's necessary for me to be successful in the course or understand what's going on because of the fact that I study philosophy and I extensively read so much of that. Um, I was in that abstract uh, muscle sense so that it wasn't that, well, it was difficult, you know, but like it wasn't like getting into something from zero, you know, uh, starting from nowhere, basically. And uh, that's kind of the same for math too. So when I was getting into um, computer science and um, applied math and statistics and whatnot, although I'm not really doing that anymore, I used to toy with the idea. 
uh, in, in college. Like switching into those discipline wasn't that bad, at least in terms of the math uh, aspect, because I was already trained in that way to think about things in an abstract way and also uh, how to write proofs in a logical manner and like constructing proofs and understanding proofs and understanding these abstract concepts. They all helped me so well in these engineering disciplines as well. So in that way, they are very similar uh, as well. So, okay, so I didn't mean this uh, video to be 15 minutes long, um, but you know, as you can already tell, I love to ramble. I love to be verbose. So <laughs> you have to deal with that, I guess. Um, yeah, so um, that's basically it. So the, the, the three basic reasons why I think math and philosophy are very similar to each other and they complement well each other. So I would highly recommend for you to think about double majoring in philosophy and math. And if you think double majoring is too much, which I understand, like it, they are both very intense abstract subjects. Why don't you um, think about, you know, minoring, minoring in math. If you're studying philosophy, maybe minor in math. If you're studying math, minor in philosophy. I think uh, those two subjects really go well with each other, uh, contrary to popular belief, and it will really enrich your experience. Uh, in education, you will get the most out of both subjects, I think, and uh, or your main subject, as they they tend to complement very well each other. I never regretted majoring both in philosophy and math, although at first I had my doubts because of the fact that like, like what am I gonna do with these two degrees? Like I will never be able to use them in a day to day manner. But you know, um, college education isn't so like supposed to be all about practicality, I would say. This is another conversation I, that I can have for hours, probably. <laughs> but um, So, you know, basically what I'm saying is that try to explore, try to explore some options. I mean, it, it, you know, like, you don't even have to do a minor. Like, you just, why don't you just um, try taking like a, one or two courses in math or philosophy? I promise you'll be worth it. So yeah, thank you for watching.